tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are graphic artists Eric Linksweiler and photographer Bill Stetz. Graphic artist, conservationist, and neon art expert Eric Linksweiler is a native Californian who has a degree in urban anthropology from UCLA. He lived near and went to grade school in the Wilshire area, was close to the La Brea Tar Pits. Was that an inspiration for you getting into conservation? Well, in a way, the La Brea Tar Pits were my introduction to Wilshire Boulevard which is where a lot of my heart really lies. I live just blocks away from the La Brea Tar Pits today, but I think that that was my introduction to urban L.A. But why? Why was, it, why was Wilshire Boulevard interesting to you? There, I mean, there were a lot of other streets in Los Angeles. I, I always <laughs> was interested in the tall buildings, the old architecture, and believe it or not, I think a lot of my interest came from old Los Angeles television shows. In oh, watching the old oh. footage of old Los Angeles and Wilshire Boulevard is still a part of that history. You started researching it early on, mm -hmm. and your research, I don't know how many years it took. <laughs> the Wilshire history book, uh, Wilshire Boulevard Grand Concourse of Los Angeles, took three years to That's make. That's what we're talking about, the book that, that you did the research. It, it only took three years? Well, only. I, I, my background on Wilshire took a lot more time than that. Well, I would think you actually did all the research and it was probably when you didn't write the book, no. which I found interesting. No. Why didn't you write the book? Well, <coughs> the short answer is that I'm not a writer. <coughs> oh. I, I did uh, try to write the book. Did and you? when the book was originally adopted <coughs> by the Los Angeles Times Press, they looked at my writing and said, oh, we'll find someone else to pair you with. They liked your project. <laughs> they liked the project. <laughs> so they paired me with Kevin Roderick, who's a freelance uh, oh. writer who used to work for the Los Angeles Times and also wrote the history of the San Fernando Valley. Oh, so that's how that happens. Mm -hmm. But it was actually you born it. Was yeah. your idea. Yeah, and I have to credit <clears throat> the Los Angeles Conservancy as well because they kind of helped nudge me along into doing this book project, which I'm very thankful for. You have favorite parts of Wilshire Boulevard, mm -hmm. which are? Well. <laughs> and how can you say that? <laughs> well, that's very difficult. My, my heart right now is in the Miracle Mile. <clears throat> I adore the Art Deco structures on the Miracle Mile and its history. But I've also grew up in Wilshire Center, so the Wilshire Center District has a, a, a soft spot in my heart. This is uh, something from... That is just down the street from me. It's the Mullen and Blewett building designed in 1949 by Stiles Clements. Uh, beautiful late modern structure with Roman brick, soon to be demolished, I'm sorry to say. It is? It Isn't is. there any way you can save something like this? Well, I tried with the Los Angeles <laughs> Conservancy and the Modern Committee of Los Angeles. We did try. How many other buildings are there then, like this, that are being demolished? I know the Ambassador mm -hmm. Hotel. Well, the Ambassador Hotel really breaks my heart. I was just there earlier this morning taking pictures of it coming down. But it's it, already coming down? It's already oh, being I demolished. See, I see, I see. Yeah, they, they, they fall at a rate of maybe three, four, five a year. When you decided to do Wilshire Boulevard, why didn't you also think of doing, say, Pico or Sunset? Sunset's pretty historic, too. That's true. There is a history book on Sunset Boulevard as it is. And I, I, I did consider it, and people are, are actually telling me, Pico is wonderful. <laughs> PCH deserves a book. I'm like, well, right. it's not really where my heart lies. For me, it's Wilshire Boulevard. Well, don't they have the same kind of buildings on, uh, well, on Sunset? Well kind of. They might have the same architectural style, but I think that the, the wealth of culture is on Wilshire Boulevard. It is considered to be the backbone of Los Angeles. 
It's, and how long is it? It's over 15 miles long. And yes, I've walked the entire <laughs> length. I, I knew you were going in there. I have to ask you, because d how long did it take you? Uh, it took over eight hours. I had breakfast in downtown and dinner in Santa Monica. Oh, so you didn't do it in sections. Did you take photographs as you went along? You know, I did not take pictures that day. I wish I had, but that really helped me. Because I got out of the car, I looked oh, past my windshield, oh. and I started seeing all the details of Wilshire Boulevard. When you, when you started doing that, did you see things that you hadn't seen before? Oh, very much so. There was actually one building in particular. It was at, I believe it was Barendo in Wilshire. And this little tiny Spanish building, if you look in the details of the plaster, there are little tiny laughing monkeys actually looking <laughs> down at you on the street. I call it the monkey building. It's still there today. I'm going to show, um, you talk about the history of Wilshire Boulevard. It's mm -hmm. Mr. Gaylord Wilshire. Oh, yes. Which kind of surprised me when I read the book because you see the Gaylord Hotel, yep. you see Wilshire Boulevard, you see Gaylord's, is there a Gaylord Street? No. No, there is no Gaylord Street, but there are other Wilshire streets and avenues throughout Southern California, <laughs> and that's all because of him. And here's Mr. Gaylord's building. Well, it was named after him. I don't think he really liked it that much. Oh, you don't? No, he didn't approve from what we could tell. The Ambassador Hotel is over on the right side and the Brown Derby is on the left. And the Brown Derby, of course, is gone. That that is one of several brown derbies in the brown derby chain, but that was the only one that was in the shape of a hat. And the LA Conservancy tried to save that building from demolition. Unfortunately, they could only <laughs> save the very top of the dome, mm -hmm. and the dome now sits at the crux of a mini mall at that very location. Mm -hmm. It's a karaoke and boba bar now. It's a good, but, but the idea is they're just like Perinos. Yeah. Did they knock Perinos out? Perinos is gone <coughs> as well. It's soon to be replaced by Perinos Apartments, if you can believe it. Oh, they keep the name, but they... Exactly. What happened? Let me show you. You can talk a little bit about these. Where do these pictures come from, by the way? Uh, the research for this book took me from Los Angeles to New York to D.C. to Sacramento, and this particular oh. photo came out of our local Los Angeles Central Library. They have a great photo archive. This photo is truly a gem because it shows a missing brown derby on it. We know of four brown derbies that existed, uh -huh. and now because of this photograph, we found the fifth. In 1930, <coughs> the owner of the brown derby chain wanted to open up a high-class restaurant, and he opened up the hi-hat. Oh. But at the Depression, it didn't succeed. He renamed it the Derby. It lived for a few months and was replaced by Perino's. Oh, is that where it was? That's where Perino's originated before they moved oh, to the, they moved the to current it. location that was just demolished. Oh, my. What happens to a street like that as buildings keep getting uh, demolished? I'm going to show this Perino's one just because you were talking about yes, it. Yes, that is the original Perino's location, I exactly Because I don't it remember was. it looking like this. No, it moved a few blocks down the street in the late 1940s. Uh. But that was its original location with the street address right on it. Actually, the Perinos, after it moved, looked more like the Beverly Hills Hotel, didn't it? Very correct, very <laughs> correct. That was a Paul Williams structure, if yes. I recall. But he didn't do Perinos, too, did he? He designed the Perinos that was just demolished. Oh, he did? Yeah, but he didn't design this particular one, which was Morgan Walls and Clements. But so there was an influence. There oh, yeah. was like this feeling that I was wondering about. So, so what do you think happens? Um, let's show this one, too. Too. When Wilshire Boulevard loses a building? Well, when it loses a building, yes. Mm -hmm. well, like it lost this building. Yeah, that's uh, Ralph's at uh, the Miracle Mile. It was demolished in the 1980s. I think we can't stop Wilshire from evolving and changing. It will always be that way. Uh, we do, with the LA Conservancy, of course, try to save one building or two. The Ambassador Hotel, of course, was a great loss to Wilshire Boulevard because it was part of the triumvirate of, uh, uh, triumvirate of culture and history. Yeah, it with, mixed everything, didn't it? Yes, <laughs> it was the Ambassador, the Brown Derby, and Bullock's Wilshire creating this trinity of uh, high life, high social life. And, and Bullock's Wilshire did stay, the structure did, mm -hmm. and it's now a law school. It's a law school library. It's what very well done. What do you think about something like that? It I is approve, well done? Actually. I actually. I approve. I think it's a beautiful reuse of the structure, uh, especially because they were planning on demolishing the building. It was actually talked about to <laughs> gut it and destroy it. Uh, thankfully, the LA Conservancy once again stepped in and saved that building. I love this building. I adore that one, too. It's so beautiful, the You'll, color, the color tiles. Yes, it is black and gold, just like oil, black gold. Uh, that 1928 Styles Clement structure is now a national 
landmark. It is in good hands oh. and uh, well taken care of. You'll note the street light out front too. That's one of the original Wilshire st Street standards from 1928. Are any of those kept? Are any of those around? Yes, actually towards downtown there's a small few that remain. One of the other parts of Wilshire Boulevard is down by where the townhouse was, oh, yeah. down by the park. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what... Parks District. Parks District, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of neon, and I remember when Al Nodell was at Otis Art Institute, he, insta he kind of was the begin beginning of, or he went to the people in the neighborhood to get their neon back yes. on. Were you aware of that at the time? Oh, quite. I am a big fan of Al Nadal. He is one of my heroes for relighting all of that neon <laughs> in Los him. Angeles. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. So, so what happened? You, you take neon guided tours. Yeah, there's, I, I have the Wilshire side of my life and there's also the neon side of my life. I've been working with the Museum of Neon Art for over seven years now and giving the neon cruises through downtown LA and Hollywood and back. And, uh, what is uh, that, a neon cruise? <laughs> a lot of people wonder, thanks for asking. The neon cruise is a guided tour in a convertible British double-decker bus. Wow. And we sit in this giant convertible and we cruise through the streets of Los Angeles looking at the nightlife, the culture, and of course all that neon. Do you hold a mic and talk like you're a tour guide? I'm a, I, I got my megaphone, my own personal megaphone. Oh, yes. Wait, but the funny thing that I was reading when we were talking about neon is that you said you teach those people how to read neon. Uh, yeah, it's true because a lot of people come to the Museum of Neon Art with a misconception of neon is kind of an ugly urban thing. Sure, it's bright and pretty at some times, but otherwise it speaks of blight and angst. But it's I don't old. see it that way. It's old, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. it's history. Los Angeles is, is dripping with historic neon. It's got a great collection of vintage, intact neon on its rooftops in Al Nadel. Thankfully, oh. saved a lot of that stuff. So, do they? They do put some of those pieces in the museum. Can yeah. you see the difference in the 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 colors? Mm -hmm. You can. Oh yeah. The, when you're actually standing right up next to some of these enormous neon signs, you can see the craftsmanship in the bending of the glass or the technical aspect, the the way it was manufactured. But when it's 80 feet 80 feet up on top of a building, you may not even acknowledge how beautiful it can be. But on eye level. Oh, it's it's a sweet piece. Is it? It, it was. Would it also be um, the typeface? Mm -hmm. Does that change over the years, or are just neons mm -hmm. neons? Well, neon can be anything you want it to be. Neon can be bent into any font that you wish. I see. But you can look back over time and and judge the 20s from the 30s from the 40s, depending on the particular type that was used, the designs, etc. And and do we do that now so that we'll know that that's the 2000s? Yeah, but frankly, a lot of the new stuff isn't really that <laughs> fantastic. I'm afraid a lot of the artistry may have been lost, especially in the 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 fall of neon in the 50s and 60s, and then its rise again in the 70s. But nowadays, we've got, the Museum of Neon Art is very careful who they have their signs restored by. Oh, that's interesting too. Mm -hmm. Well, our urban anthropologist Eric Linksweiler, we're glad we now we know what an urban anthropologist is. <laughs> Look at the world around you; it's all urban and gorgeous. And keep researching for us. I'd be happy to. <laughs> we'll be right back with Bill Stetz, the photographer whose work is on the set. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with photographer William Stetz, who was born and raised in Illinois. He graduated from the University of Illinois and took classes at NYU. Were those classes in photography, Bill? No, those weren't in photography. Those were in uh, actually in sound production. Oh, were you always going to be a photographer, or were you going to be something else? I've done a lot of other things. I've done film production and set design and uh, as oh. well as photography, but um, my photography is probably my longest running uh, gig, you would say. Well, h how did you choose that? over all these other things that are pretty interesting. Set designing is great, I you think. You know, I've always had an affinity for photography ever since I was in probably a junior high school. Did and you have a camera then? Yes, I did. With yeah. film, I'm sure. I did. <laughs> With film, for sure, yeah. What kind of cameras were there? Instamatic? I, I had a 
Starlight or Starmite. It was a Kodak camera, and uh, um, and then I've used a camera that my father loaned me, and uh, eventually my parents bought me a camera, which I used uh, uh, for a while in high school. Yeah, photography is a pretty tough business to get into. It is, but you got to persevere. And but how? What kind of breaks does someone need? You came out of a production stage set I mean you had some things going for you that other people wanting to be photographers wouldn't have mm -hmm. well I also always integrated my photography into any other kind of work that I did so uh, if I was working on sets there was always a need for a photographer or I used my <laughs> photography in the set design you did it you took photographs I, too I took photographs <laughs> yeah and, and, and then but did you have the knowledge of the darkroom? I learned darkroom procedures in high school when I was a oh, sophomore. You did. Oh, so you really were building a background. It just didn't quite happen after college. It was No, kind I, of going. I did photography for a long time where I was oh. developing my own pictures and I've always had a darkroom. Oh, you oh. And I've done uh, lots of manipulation with photographs in the darkroom. So Let's talk about getting into it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how a break comes. Yours was different. How would a photographer get into photography? I think just by doing it, just by continually doing and practicing photography and making sure that uh, you make it known that that's what you do. Uh, because I, uh, I would uh, work for some publications where I would got the opportunity to meet celebrities like uh, Steven Spielberg and Clint the Eastwood. And so I would photograph these <laughs> celebrities as well, and that just adds on to itself. It, it's a building process. Well, were those part of an assignment? Yes. So it was editorial. Yes. So I guess if you get into editorial, you can show your work, and maybe an editor picks you and says, you know, shoot the subject of this story. Yes. And once you've shot a couple more of those it builds and you can show it to other editors and uh, and get more assignments and then what about commercial commercial um, I do commercial I have done commercial work studio work as well as advertising work and that's yeah, usually that's... a studio that's studio work strictly so it requires learning uh, the lighting process of lighting with strobe lights and it's a pretty tedious process because everything depends on the perfect lighting and the perfect composition and making sure that the the, uh, the subject or the product looks as good as possible. Well, these pictures that are on the set are not in the studio. No. And, and this picture of Steven Spielberg is not in the studio. No, that's at Amblin. And I'm going to show this picture of Clint Eastwood is mm -hmm. not in the studio. No, that's at MGM. So how do you light these um, Are they lit the same way as in the studio? No, no. Steven Spielberg was lit with strobe lights to, in, in accent to the daylight that was there. Uh, Clint Eastwood was shot strictly with the lighting that was behind the scenes on the set uh, um, for his film in the Line of Fire. Oh, so when you go on uh, it's, off it's, the set, when yeah. you go on location, let's mm -hmm. say. Do you know what you're going to be taking with you? No. <laughs> you have to prepare for the worst. And, and a lot of time there's improvisation that's incorporated, and uh, improvising is probably just as important to the photographer as uh, being uh, ready to do a, an assignment that you know what the lighting's going to be. So, so you don't approach each shoot is approached in a different way? Have, has to be has to be. Like these on the set, say. These were taken um, in a natural setting, um, obviously uh, with, with the lighting that was there. And so I'm basically preparing myself for uh, what, what I encounter on, on, on that particular moment. The one on the bottom, mm -hmm. you have the clouds and the, that whole feeling of I don't know, there's like a, a desperation, a loneliness about it. Yeah, it's an earthiness too, I think. Yeah. It's a very earthy picture for me. And that was taken in Jamaica. Oh, so that, and, and do you take your camera with you everywhere? Pretty much. You yeah. do? Yeah. So what camera 
did you use for years for shooting these kind of things? I used film cameras for many years, as we said. I used, uh, mostly I used a Leica, which I brought with oh, me. Oh, let's see that. Yeah, this is a, a very old camera, in fact. Oh, when really? I bought it, it was an old camera, and it's very, it's it. very heavy. This is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the regular film camera. It's a 35 millimeter camera. That camera is almost as old as I am. But Leica was like the best and you got the best pictures out of these. The Leica produces the, the most finely, fine portraits and, and fine photography that I can think of. This you just is, look at it. Oh, it's Even great. though it's so old, you look at it and you well, know that it's going to give you something good. Not only that, <laughs> listen to it. It sounds like a watch. Listen. Hold it up to your mic and do yeah. it again. Yeah, it's great. It's it is. It's perfect. Very isn't precise. It? Very. So uh, now you're working with digital, but this yeah. digital camera looks huge. Is it that is. it? This is, a, this is a digital camera that I use. I also use a, a more of a consumer uh, digital camera, which is much smaller, but this is more of a professional model. And this is very heavy. And I <clears throat> personally find it a oh. little cumbersome to use. How could you hold it and shoot and you have you, other you, stuff? You have to have muscles. <laughs> and, and I use a monopod too, which holds the camera in place. But this, you see the film, you see the picture right away. You can see the picture right away, but it's best to look at it, at it on a computer. Oh, is that what you do? And then yeah. what do you do when you, oh, I can't even hold it, when you get it back to the studio, do you manipulate it in any way? Um, more often than not, I will manipulate the photograph to look like I envision. And if you take a look at some other pictures there, you can see. I'm going to hold these up. Yeah. Should we start with this one on the end? Sure. That is the only digital, no, actually, that's a digital picture, and that's a digital picture. So this first one? Mm-hmm. The first one's digital. Um, Can you point anything out in it that um, shows us that? Basically, what I did to manipulate this was I added a little lighting on the wall in the background because uh -huh. it, it went very dark on this side of the photograph, and now I think it has a little more interest. You also, do that on the computer? Do that on the computer. Also, it has a little more light in the eyes so that the eyes stand out. And the one in the middle? The one in the middle was shot with film, and that was shot in Greece, and then it was transferred to a digital format and manipulated. Can, oh, you can, oh, you do, oh, you transferred it so that you're using both mm -hmm. processes. Yes, what I did was I took the negative and scanned the negative into the uh, program that I use Photoshop and then manipulated the photo as I needed to to <laughs> represent what I think or remember I saw. And uh, I think it, that's a pretty successful picture of myself. And the last one? And the last one is a digital picture, and that was taken with more of a consumer type photograph and then blown up and manipulated a little bit. So have all your, your pictures always been manipulated? Well, you know, like, in see the, the in, Steven Spielberg, has that been manipulated? That's a pretty straight picture. That was a film shot, and uh, it was scanned and printed digitally, but it's pretty straight as to the, what it was originally. When when <coughs> you choose black over black and white over mm -hmm. color, how do you do that? What what tells you what to shoot and how to shoot it? Um, well, I think I go through phases in terms of, of what I shoot. Mo for many many years, I shot strictly f black and white. Uh, uh, when I got more, I think that's what photographers think. Black and white is really um, what uh, archival. It, it, it is archival, but it's also very expressive because you're dealing strictly with light and dark. And I think you, you get a more artistic look mm. about it. Um, so what do you prefer, color or black and white? I prefer the black and white. Oh, I think do? it's more dramatic. I, I really do. You're having a show at the, tell me the name of the gallery. It's the Risk Press Gallery. So hard to say. I know, Risk, Risk Press. Risk Press. Does it mean something, Risk Press? It's... <laughs> It stands for the, the company that owns it. Oh, Apparently, uh, they, ha they are publishers as well. I see. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's on Melrose, and you're having a show there. Mm -hmm. But it's also a, a charity show. Right. And it's going to benefit Chrysalis, which is an organization that uh, helps uh, the homeless get, off their f get on their feet and, and back into the workforce. I was reading some of, uh, some of that mm -hmm. uh, and how many people they've gotten back onto into working situations mm -hmm. i guess off the street they dress them they 
do many they other train them they sometimes train them, yeah. and they help them get interviews and uh, yeah, I think it's a good organization. So yeah. your work will be up for a month. It'll be up for a month. You're working on a book. I'm working on a book about Chicago. We um, don't have it with us, but um, it, actually, I guess it's no, we didn't leave okay. it here. Okay, all right. And the book is uh, is going to be called the Chicago Years. And it's oh, because you're from there. I'm from there. That's right. No wonder. Yes. And you have all those fabulous buildings there. Hundreds of hundreds of pictures of not only buildings but people, um, city situations, uh, walk uh, walk a day life people. Uh, it's uh, I think a beautiful book. Are you going to write in it? Too? I am going to write. Each of the pictures will have comments or some story attached to it uh, that either describes the situation in which I took the picture or maybe my own reflection about the city at that time. How long does it take to do a project like that? Uh, I think just putting together the, um, the photographs and making sure they're in the form that I want to present them. Are they taken now or do you have to they're, go they're back? All taken. They're oh, all they taken. All are, they're all taken. It'll take me several months to, to put that together. And then? And then find a publisher. <laughs> You have to find a publisher. That's right. Or you can have a show. Uh, oh, of course. In fact, I'd, I'd like to have a show at the Chicago Historical Society, um, which is yet to be seen, but uh, I'm going to pitch them on that. Yeah, that's a fabulous building, too. It is. And it was, it's great to have the, the photographs because you haven't taken the building per se. You've taken portions of buildings, haven't mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I have a Los Angeles building series, too. We're talking about portrait photography. If you were going to shoot me as a subject, mm -hmm. what would you do? Hmm. I think <clears throat> I think maybe we'd do something that was uh, probably have a dark background with a little dr drama to to the lighting of it. In uh, color. In color, yeah. Because I f I think you're you're very colorful, and I think that would that would certainly be an attractive approach. And we did discuss a little bit on the phone about using window light. And, and I, don't, I think that would be a good idea, too. So you don't need to bring lights in. Um, would I, you put I, I me might, in a certain place? What would you do? Well, I, I, I'd have to see your environment. I see. And then I would size it up. I but, see. But it would take, you know, take So you have time. to get to meet the person, what I was getting Well, this, at. Is, a per this is a perfect <laughs> time to, to meet you and, and get to know who you are. And then you do your portrait after of that. Of course, of course. Bill, thank you very much. Thank William you. Stetz, our photographer of the day, and thanks for watching the show. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thank <laughs> you.